So what we're talking about today is working after the hazards of working after disaster. Uh, my name and, and we're with uh, this is being put together by the Rhode Island Committee for Occupational Safety and Health. My name is Fred Malaby and the and I work with Rikosh and uh, on the phone is Jim Salenza and Jim is the uh, the leader of Rikosh. Jim, do you want to give anything in the way of explanation of what RICOSH is, does, et cetera? Local environmental, occupational environmental health center here in Rhode Island. Uh, focused on, you know, providing technical assistance um, and training. Uh, the, uh, the training component um, is of two parts. One is we're connected to the New England Consortium, which is uh, New England, New York. Network, um, which does provide a lot of training on hazardous materials. Um, and also, we are part of the uh, Susan B. Harwood Post Training Project. And that, um, uh, the funding for this, this training today comes from the Susan B. Harwood uh, Training Program. And uh, um, it, it, in no way, however, does it request the official uh, of the Department of Labor or or OSHA. So, although OSHA does review the materials in the curriculum, um, they, they, uh, we, we in no way uh, what it said here represents their opinion. A couple of things uh, this grant requires us to do. One is that we do a post and a pre and a post, a quiz kind of thing, and we'll, we'll Fred will carry it out in a, in a bit. And uh, the other thing it requires us to do is that after uh, two to three months from the conclusion of the uh, seminar, uh, we'll contact you for some review uh, information in terms of, you know, um, how it went, you know, your uh, evaluation seminar. It's, it's part of their, it's part of their bureaucracy that we have to do that. You'll, you'll hear from us again in three months. If not before. But, um, the, uh, so the, the, the basic principles of what we're going to look at today is review the kinds of situations, worker space, post, post the death. Um, you know, we'll, uh, Jim, we'll, Jim you're you, cutting out. Okay, I can't. I don't know what to do about that right this <laughs> Um Just so you know. All right. Okay, so talk a little bit about um, if we're going to talk about emergencies, uh, we need to talk about knowing what emergencies we find in our area. Although, uh, you know, one of the things that Jim and I discussed was do we put, you see the risks uh, that we've got there, things like blizzards and, and frequent downpours. Like, is that, has that been true in the last little while? Um, extreme colds and heat waves and so forth. One of the ones Jim and I debated for, for this area is wildfires. We don't have a lot of them, but last year we had three out in my area. So um, they, they, you can have wildfires in this area, but probably not, it's not likely that we're gonna have a wildfire that, that causes an emergency, a, a, a real big emergency. Although there were there were some people displaced on the last last year, but these are some of the, the um, floods and so forth. We and also tornadoes. Um, we had, and I don't know. I thought that, that was on the list, but somehow I must have deleted it by accident. Uh, we had a tornado yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, in Rhode Island. So yesterday or Sunday in Rhode Island, small one. Um, but. This is some of the, the things that we tend to get. So what are the common hazards that we have? Well, we've got things like uh, electric, uh, those things that are listed here, electricity, flooding, um, and, and some of the other things that are listed, all having to do with either what the, the um, event caused, so water with flooding, uh, hazardous chemical hazardous chemicals. It has been um, 
take and been knocked uh, made, knocked loose from where it was originally, et cetera, or related to the equipment that we're going to be using or the activities we're going to be doing to clean up the the um, disaster. All right. After the, the this is just pointing to several things that are, are after a flood. Um, certainly, uh, there are there's three th things that we're talking about here. One is there are things that you uh, that you can't can't do unless you are uh, uh, you are trained uh, as and have the background in order to do it. And a, a big one is if we're talking about dealing with uh, down power lines or something of that nature. Uh, then don't you just leave the power lines alone? Let the power company deal with that, because you need to be a, a lineman or or have a lot of experience to be able to work with that. Um, if we're talking, and then the other big hazard is driving, and uh, during flood conditions, um, there's been a that that's something that gets uh, underestimated by drivers all the time. You think it's just a small puddle, and it's actually deeper than it. It uh, was you originally thought it was, and it maybe it has some some running. Uh, it has a, a moving water component to it, uh, or uh, you know, a small amount of uh, sometimes six inches of standing water is enough to stall the car, and now you're stuck in the middle of the uh, of some um, moving water, and and uh, then you have a bigger problem um, altogether. So be very careful. When, when working or when you're dealing with something where there's flooding uh, of, of any kind. Electrical hazards, we're gonna kind of go through some of the hazards. Electrical hazards come down to the electricity. Usually it has electric shock. You, someone can, you can have burns or you can have a fire. Electricity can cause fires. And after some disasters, you, you start, um, you start taking and, and moving electric wires around in, in one way or another, uh, if the, the, either because of the storm or, or because you're, you're taking some action of some kind, um, you, can, you, can have a, a, the, you can cause arcing behind the wall or cause arcing in, uh, in general, and uh, you can have a fire, um, burns, electricity, electricity can cause burns and it can cause electrocution. Uh, and then the third bullet there is is falls ca um, caused by contact with electricity. Uh, this NIOSH did us did some follow up on some some um, hazards for electricians, and they found that the second major uh, cause of accidents amongst electricians is falling off a ladder when they've gotten a small shock from uh, from electricity because it, it it jolts them and then they're they're thrown off the ladder. So um, it, these are uh, very real issues with, that, that you can have uh, from, from electricity. Um, so you want to avoid what, working with it in wet environments. If you're, go, if you're going to be outside, at the very least, you need to be protected by this little device that I, I'm circling here. I don't know how to get this, a ground fault interrupter. Uh, if you don't know what a ground fault interrupter is, uh, then ground fault circuit interrupter, I should say, um, then that's what you have. If you go to your, your kitchen or your bathroom and you look at the receptacle that's alongside your sink, you'll see that there's some buttons in the middle of it. Uh, those buttons are to provide extra protection because if, um, if, if you have water present, it makes it much easier for uh, electricity to flow through you, and so this these th this unit uh, shuts off the the, the uh, electricity before it, be it you can become electrocuted. Um, and then they talk. Yeah, this last bullet says, you know, don't re-energize equipment until uh, you it's been evaluated. The equipment's been evaluated by an electrician, qualified electrician. If for some reason it's down, uh, it could be that there's problems, particularly with with uh, fire, potential for fire. Portable generators are commonly used. Obviously, if you're going to use a generator that's going to this that you, relies on um, uh, relies on, on uh, some sort of fuel, it's burn. Then the fuel is going to cause give off carbon monoxide in some way or other, uh, and that carbon monoxide is a very toxic gas. It 
it has no odor uh, and it it's deadly. Uh, you if you're going to use a a generator in don't use it indoors if possible or if you, you have if you're using it indoors if you've got one built into your house make sure that the uh, the generator ha is properly vented to the outside. Um, the other hazard from this is, is that many of our generators are now designed that you, so that you can hook them right into the electricity in the house. And so now you're turning a generator, you have the generator running. Uh, one of the concerns can be that it went, if they do try to bring it to work on the electricity, you get what's called backfeed, which means that the electricity actually is carried rather than being just in your dwelling, it's now being carried out to the power supply and what was non-energized electrical uh, electric, electrical parts now are energized and you can it can be a, a hazard to, to uh, uh, the people working on the power lines. So that that's a and if you, if you're working around any sort of, of electrical power lines, understand that there are people that will have this and not and they'll have hooked up to to a they're hooked up their house in one way or another, and they don't have something that will stop the, that, that feedback um, so that that, uh, that can be a, a hazard uh, as well. Um, and of course, if you've got a generator and you're running it for any length of time, you've got hot parts to it. There's going to be the, the manifolds, whatever your manifolds you have, those manifolds are going to be hot. So uh, as the generator is running out of fuel, if you're using, say, gasoline that ignites pretty easily, you need to be careful as you refill it so that you and let the let the, the generator cool down a little bit before you refill it, because that can be a, an ignition source for the gasoline. And this is talking a little more about carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, as it says, it's it's odorless. And every year in the in New England, we run into people that die from improperly vented heating systems, which use, uh, you know, if they don't use, may not use gasoline, but they still use an in some sort of internal combustion. And that combustion the, uh, uh, creates carbon monoxide. And it's the same uh, kind of problem. And, and it can be a problem if you're, let's say you're doing some sort of work and you decide you're going to use a generator or you're going to use Gas powered equipment indoors. Uh, you're, you know, the, the classic is some, uh, we've had several fatalities in New England where someone uh, was hired to do, uh, to do uh, waxing of a floor and they used uh, uh, gas, yeah. gas powered um, uh, for, forklift, or I mean, excuse me, gas powered buffer. And they don't, the, the store is closed, they're doing it at night. And the next morning, you either have somebody who's very sick or dead because they carbon monoxide built up and you don't smell it. You don't realize it's a problem until you go to sleep and don't wake up. So that's um, concern, the concerns with carbon monoxide. Okay, so let's we'll move ahead. So we're talking about, now we're talking about hazardous chemicals. The kinds of things that you can run into after disaster are, there's all kinds of, this, this kind of gives the, the three biggest ones, uh, household garbage, building materials, and yard waste. It, however, if you're around some sort of industrial complex, you can get in, you can run into other chemicals that. Um, all right, Fred, uh, they, I'm back. <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. Oh, man. So we um, are just about to launch into uh, the slide after hazardous chemicals. So one of the things um, in terms of responding to most uh, disaster situations is the presence of chemicals, so the variety of chemicals, quite, uh, quite uh, significant. But, you know, two uh, basic domains when we're kind of thinking about this in terms of after a uh, after some kind of a disaster. And this, again, it depends on the type of disaster. If it's a disaster where something happens where people lose power, um, then there are processes in industry and there are uh, chemicals in certain facilities in industry where that can have an impact in terms of people who might be coming in after the, uh, you know, after the 
like the company is restored uh, and deal with some of those products. Uh, and if we look at uh, you know, maybe probably the one feature of, of our, our environment that we're concerned about is weather, uh, from primarily the you know the heavy rains and or a coastal flooding or interior flooding as well. Um, and the second major domain would be of course heat. Uh, but in terms of the chemical uh, types of chemicals that are out there, if you're getting a, a situation where in uh, what we've seen in, in Houston and in the Gulf Coast, other areas where there's been major impact to disaster, you've got large scale um, uh, the uh, impact of uh, different chemicals that are um, you know used in industry. So that, for example, uh, uh, in in Houston, uh, the uh, in 2010, the NIHS National Institute of Health set up a, uh, an environmental health sciences institute to begin uh, researching uh, what happens to folks on these types of chemicals. And um, what they found, for example, in the, after Hurricane Harvey in uh, in Houston, uh, they actually looked at uh, the select number of people who responded clean up after that, in which you know there was a, 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 a dislodging of a lot of the chemical products and a lot of the industry around there, fertilizer plants, refineries, chemical plants, and uh, folks who had to come in later after the um, thing was stabilized and clean up. They did actually did a, did a review of kind of the, what kind of a health effect they had that kind of, and they found you know a number of things. Um, they find uh, you know uh, skin irritation, skin problems, and respiratory problems. Um, and similar type of studies were done in the Gulf, and people responded to the uh, the oil spills down there, and they did actually detect some uh, biomarkers. Of uh, increased impact health in terms of liver uh, function and uh, also uh, blood function in terms of uh, the, the workers work or designated to to control the, the oil spills so to remediate as much as could. In addition to the kind of large industrial types of exposure people make, uh, there are also a whole range of Know, commercial products, products that are coming in the home, products that are in uh, stores, variety of stores that people might be exposed to if the store, for example, gets flooded, um, and in which they are asked to come in to deal with and you know, taking care of those products, moving them, putting them, uh, putting them aside. Yeah. Okay, so there's also issues of, of household garbage, and it's, we've seen in a lot of these situations, in front of houses, tons of materials piled up, uh, you know, in terms of waiting for people to take away. Sometimes they're sitting there for days. And in some situations, some of those are going to be appliances, some some are going to be paint, some are going to be chemicals, some are cleaning chemicals that have been used in the house, you know, my detergents, things like Clorox. So there's a whole range of, of Potential chemical exposure may occur as people start removing the debris and removing the, the the types of debris that might be found, you know, on the sidewalk and in and around the either you know a commercial facility or in a, in a residential. Next slide. I, and I wanted to add um, just just before we move to the next slide uh, that the hazard that the waste that you have at the um, at a local house. You don't think about how much you have, but when you when you start cleaning the entire place out, and now what was a little bit of bleach and a little bit of that, and then the other, then other things that you had in storage, suddenly you've got quite a bit of uh, fairly hazardous uh, chemicals that can come out of a house. So, all right, we're on. In addition, yeah, in addition to the variety of products. You know, people might be exposed to, for example, you know, uh, gasoline products from uh, you know people that, ha that have gasoline or diesel fuel in their house or using it, um, you know, for their generators. You might find a whole lot of situations where uh, containers, batteries, different kind of containers that have been in the facility or the house. But again, 
when when folks are responding to these these situations, they could be responding to a residential or an industrial facility. And each one's going to going to pose a, a set of unique a unique sometimes common has. Um, so the, the, there's an important uh, element in the response uh, mode, which is that uh, we, we, we need to have a clear understanding that there are some uh, you know, uh, regular regulations that uh, uh, help us identify chemicals. Uh, in terms of the industrial situation, we know that uh, any of the products they use in industry that it might be extremely hazardous have to be reported to the Department of Environment Management, and that, you know the nature of those you know, those hazards associated with those chemicals, as well as you know where they were located in specific sites. So if we had an example here in Rhode Island of the port where uh, you know the sea level rise and inundated the port in different areas, there would be uh, an, it would be important to know what the products were in those facilities. That people might be responding to as they come up back, and uh, that 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 information would be part of the, the larger emergency response that is that has been, uh, been developed to respond to those. Things. So that that information is important to be conveyed to the people or the subcontractors and deal with. Um. And that might entail the, the necessity of providing chemical clothing rest to uh, those types of work. Um, and oftentimes, that, unfortunately, we see that that, that, that can become a complicated problem and the number of responders and the and, uh, level of training they get. Because a lot of times, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks are recruited fairly quickly uh, to respond clean up. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's been noted in the past, certainly in the situation in the Gulf, certainly in areas where hurricanes have come in and in terms of is that people are not will arrive on site who, have, who, don't, who don't have a, a lot of So one of the things that, you know, is important that obviously folks who are in clean up is they they are trained and uh, recognized types of labels that might be on, uh, you know, chemical containers of various types to identify some of the problems they may be dealing with. Um, you know, hope, hopefully, you know, we'll get better at uh, prepping people who do respond to emergencies like this, go through some more, uh, you know, rigorous, lengthy training regarding chemical exposures, regarding uh, the types of information get also labeling system and uh, and other as as communication programs and facilities might have again labels on some commercial products household products you know um, you know will be helpful helpful if people can identify them as fortunately in, in there are certain situations where the labels you know simply don't exist anymore on some of those and that creates a problem in finding out what is actually in those so um there's a it's sort of a, a an important again an important aspect of the pre the pre response is trained folks how to respond they don't know what's in it important that that level we as a society you increase we increase so this is an example of the uh, the uh, of the OSHA uh, labeling require, uh, that are you'll see on some. Again, it's, it'd be, it's important that work uh, have as they respond review uh, review these labeling so that they are uh, you know prepared to deal with whatever they. But once again, in a lot of situations, debris, household debris, even commercial. Some of these labels won't be on. Now, this is the general uh, information about some of the information about what what's in a container, the size, what it's, uh, it, whether it's uh, you know plastic or metal. Um, 
know, the, the whole question of decree, one of the more significant people that goes to a variety of and uh, paint cans, and, and a lot of materials put into bags, plastic bags. Yeah, but Jim, what slide are you using, looking at? Uh, it has to do with containers. Okay, so I need to move up one, that's all. You cut out, I think you said advance a slide, I didn't hear it. All right, so has is a containers, yep. So again, it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the integrity of the containers may be a, a problem in terms of uh, we have them been damaged by the event. Again, we're kind of focusing on a, on a water-based, you know, a flood situation or a sea lion situation. Which I think it's probably the most common one we're going to see here in New England. Um, but uh, so again, the, the the information that's conveyed through the uh, the, the re reporting system for uh, extremely hazardous chemicals, the ocean requirements uh, are you know critical, and uh, the, the labeling are critical. But they won't always be there in terms of a lot of the material that people. Have. So once again, there's going to there's going to be a, a way to kind of focus uh, how we. Um, we uh, prepare people to respond. Uh, the relatively unknown, and certainly the condition standards are a key part of that. Um, and again, hopefully, free response training would provide people with better understanding. Then you're cutting so, out again. All right, the next slide, Fred. All right. Okay, so we have a, a variety of things like batteries, and then the, as, as we move towards more electrical vehicles, most of the things we're going to see a lot more uh, lithium batteries in terms of than we see now in vehicles, but also in uh, electronics, a variety of different Not only the, the, the large lithium batteries in the vehicle situation, but uh, you know, small batteries, kind of stuff that hopefully, uh, you know, we, we recycle. We'll find that in a lot of cases that that's just some, some of those kinds of, of things we're going to end. Because yeah. plastic, traditional batteries, you know, of course, contain acid. We're obviously going to talk about electrical lithium batteries. Run of the mill batteries to be a hazard in all, uh, and, and uh, certainly a uh, waste of all debris. Jim, you're cutting out. Okay. All right, next slide. I think we'll, we'll move to paint the thinners. Oh yeah, you know these are normally these are you know they're you know, they're labeled with reasonable amount of information. But an example of what you can find in both finding the commercial facilities, household uh, household debris. And uh, and yeah. some structural, structural problems, you know, asbestos, Fred. Um, and um, you know, obviously, building materials that are in include not only asbestos, uh, but other kinds of uh, uh, exposures that people may have. So, in either clean out an interior in, in environment, those have to be those recognized, tried to appropriate protection. You're cutting out again. All right. So it's best just, uh, why don't we move to overhead debris, Fred, and you'll take that. Okay. Yeah. One of the concerns, we, you know, Jim was, the way we divided this, Jim was, was dealing with the chemicals. And so now I'm going to talk about a few of the physical hazards that we can be dealing with. 
anytime you're talking about something that's going to uh, destabilize a, a structure or uh, something of that nature, you're, there's a chance for overhead debris, as well as things like tree limbs that get caught in the tree, or uh, if, if one of the other uh, concerns is you, in a, if you're in a forested area, then you can have uh, the, the tree roots such that they, they pull the tree over. Now you've got potential for either overhead or falling debris that come down on you. Um, and and the, the tree example uh, the, it would be if you've got a tree that um, one of the classic problems that you deal with in the, in the forestry industry is what they call a widow maker, which is a tree that's come loose in some way and it's literally leaning against trees that are next to it. Now you start doing some removing of, of the brush and trees and you run into a problem that 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 the tree that was that's not stable falls on the on the or the forester or on the person doing the other cutting, um, and around buildings you got things that come loose uh, after the 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 uh, tornado in Springfield, which happened in uh, ten or so years ago. Uh, OSHA, uh, the OSHA office in Springfield, actually went out the next day and walked down the street, and they. They had contractors that uh, were working near buildings that were, you know, and if you're in, around Springfield, you'll see a lot of buildings that were brick and that some of the winds had, had pushed the brick such that they was, the, the wall was actually bowing out, but the person was working uh, on it, maybe on a building next door and they weren't aware that the, that, the, that wall was bulging and was ready to collapse. And they, so there's, there's a number of things of that nature that can be problems. Um, and then, it, you know, you can have things like, uh, like they say, unsecured building contents. So you got, you know, the, you have, um, I responded to Katrina. Uh, one of the things that we found was things like a gazebo that had was wound up in, in trees and uh, a, uh, some bathtubs that were, at, that had been pulled out and were, were around the, the, the street and that kind of thing. So you can run into uh, things that can happen. Wind can do a lot of damage. Uh, and when you're responding, you have to be aware of those those possibilities. Uh, so you need to have, as it says, you need to have PP, the proper PPE, hard hats, work clothes, and so forth. But if you had something like, a, like I say, like a tree or some of the larger debris, then it comes down to actually evaluating the area in advance because you, the, if a tree comes down on you, that hard hat isn't going to help a lot. Debris piles, you know, if you've got debris sitting, there's always the potential for that being unstable, having voids, things of that nature. Uh, when it's being, when a house comes down like that or a structure comes down and leaves a pile, uh, the, that pile can have void spaces. It can have problems with fire. Or you can have, um, you could have live electrical lines, that kind of thing in the pile. So you need to be uh, careful as you're you're working around it, and then if you start using things like like uh, heavy equipment to pick up the piles, again uh, having uh, being careful around it because those that's the debris is a problem uh, as you're picking it up, and if you're working around, we're going to talk a little bit later, but if you're working around heavy equipment, you've got the potential for struck by and 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 are caught in between hazards with with that equipment. Uh, something that anyone that's responding in a circumstance where there will be structural damage to buildings uh, should know something about uh, the, the various methods that um, buildings can be inspected and condemned uh, or, or can be marked uh, so that as you approach, if, if you're approaching a building and you're thinking about you, you need to enter it to do some sort of work, you're approaching structure, you need to enter it. Uh, look for things like this kind of, of um, uh, activity, or if the urban search and rescue teams have been there, been to the building, then they're going. They have a very specific marking system that they use, uh, and this is a picture. Looks like a picture from uh, Katrina. Uh, they this gives the anyone that comes afterwards, any other USAR team or other responders that come after this, each quadrant of this picture gives different information. Um, there, were some <laughs> there were some people that uh, didn't like the fact that they wound up with paint on the, on the uh, 
outside of their, their buildings. So now the uh, urban search and rescue teams have gone to a decal. And this gives you uh, kind of the, the different things that you would find. So you would find a decal like this. If, if, a, if an urban search and rescue team has been to, the, to, to a structure, they will put a decal of this type in a window, usually in a window next to an entrance. So it's going to tell you, this gives what the different pieces of information are. The big thing is, what are the hazards that are in the building? If they're telling you that this building is structurally unstable and shouldn't be entered, that'll be in information that's listed here. Uh, but usually it's a one word listing, uh, but you need to know those things if you're going to be working around a structure. And, and the USAR teams have people that, uh, that can make those kinds of determinations. Debris removal, uh, whenever you're working around debris, you have the potential. We already have talked about void spaces and some of those kinds of things, but there's also debris can have things like nails and, and uh, they can have things that can get kicked loose. You've got, you can have um, potential for, for getting uh, uh, some sort of a blade or other thing that can cut you. So you need to be sure you have uh, good st sturdy work gloves um, and, and long pants and shirt. Uh, believe me, this was something that, um, that the contractors, I know at, at, at Katrina, the contractors had a hard time sometimes getting their employees, especially their temporary employees to understand they had to wear long pants and shirt because it was a hundred degrees and 95% humidity, shorts, <laughs> everyone preferred, but you, with the hazards that, are, that you can run into, that can be a problem. And, and then we talk about debris from hazardous chemicals and destabilized piles, and you can see some of the other things that are here. Um, and, and there are, you sh we should be aware that in a major disaster, that there are methods, there are methods out there that that are used by FEMA and the Corps of Engineers and some and localities to divide up various various debris so that uh, you don't have things um, that are mixing uh, and people are, have the proper have proper PPE when they're working with a particular uh, type of debris um, and we of course we talked about here about dealing with Jim already talked about asbestos lead polychlorinated biphenyls, all things that you can easily run into in a, in a house. And of course, mold um, is something that we, we run into. This is a, these, by the way, these little um, one pagers are taken from a booklet that was put together uh, by the Center of um, Service Employees in New, in New York. Um, and this, this was a, a document to, to, talk, to hand out, they used to hand out to people to, to give them quick training. You got somebody that gets picked up uh, to do some work. They, they you know, they, uh, maybe it's a temporary job. How do you train them? Well, this is, this is what they used for training them. Um, and this is talking about exposure to chemicals. We've already talked about that. Uh, blood is, a, is an issue. Um, uh, People can be exposed to, to blood or other potentially infectious material. Uh, that's one type of biological hazard. Uh, of course, another, and, and those uh, can result in hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, AIDS, things of that nature uh, that we need to be aware of. If you're picking up, um, if someone is throwing away something like uh, like syringes and they don't put them in, a, in the proper containers, this is something that they ran into. A, they've run into a number of times with, when you have you're just pulling everything out of a, out of a house after disaster. Um, so the the stuff winds up in in uh, the ever present black bag, and someone picks up the black bag and gets stuck, uh, and you don't know whether that syringe was used or not and that becomes so you need to treat all of that material as though it is infectious um, sewage uh, is an ongoing is of course a problem that uh, you, you can have a number of of organic materials in it sewage is, is a problem with uh, in, in Rhode Island when we had the the uh, back in 2010 when we had the uh, floods 
um, one of the issues that the that was dealt with um, by several organizations was how do we safely deal with sewage? How do we because you, you, the, you, all of our sewer plants are located along waterways. So if there's flooding, the sewer plant uh, takes a hit. So now what do we do with, with the, the sewage debris, the sewerage debris? What do we do with sewage that winds up in, getting picked up from, from a, 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 the, the, because the sewer lines are overflowing or because you have a, a, a the sewer uh, has a, 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 an area that lets extra water go. Um, all things that can be uh, hazard, hazards that you deal with in, in this kind of thing. And this lists some of the different kinds of bacteria, et cetera, that you can run into and, and diseases that can be caused. Workers need to know that they just can't walk into the sewer. They need into the, that water, they need proper protection. Insects, especially in the summer, insects can be a problem and causing the, some of the various things. I'm not gonna go into the individual um, items, but they should be aware that there are a number of different kinds of insects that can be a problem. Um, in this area, of course, Lyme disease is an ongoing problem and it doesn't go away just because uh, you had a flood or we had a, a tornado. Uh, if anything, it can spread it a little more. Uh, West Nile virus, of course, and some of the other things that are listed here can be, can be problems and the answers. You wanna be sure that the worker has long sleeves, has some sort of insect repellent that that uh, is uh, has uh, the proper amounts of, of DEET, um, and that that the that the um, protective clothing is properly um, treated, um, and that uh, you have um, in this. Then it's interesting they talk here about double sided tape uh, around the ankles for to to capture ticks. Uh, you can also do that around uh, around your wrists if you if that can, if that way you're sure that your the rest of your body is protected except for uh, your hands and and that and um, your your feet um, and if, and so this is some of the different hazards that biologic hazards insect hazards that we can have um, and Jim you want, did you want to talk about heat stress yep back from the dead too. <laughs> Finally got through the system. Oh God! So um, heat and cold related issues. Uh, it come. Um, hello, hello. Oh, yeah, you're there. Yep. So the uh, uh, conditions in terms of responding. Uh, obviously, the weather conditions are a significant factor in terms of when you respond. Uh, clean up situations in the cold weather. Uh, it's you know really it's one of the probably most serious problems is the slips and falls because the, the, the terrain is really now frozen and um, uh, in, in addition to that you know people might be uh, having to work on uh, from heights uh, which are getting slippery as a result of the uh, you know, wetness and the, and the and the frozen uh, quality of the terrain that they're working on heat is obviously a major issue in the, in the summertime. Um, the uh, variety of, uh, you know, heat stress related disorders, pretty, uh, pretty common and, and, and we've seen this kind of time and time again in the response to the, the variety of uh, uh, disaster events uh, that we're, 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 we're be looking at in the last couple of years. The, um, so it's important to have a heat uh, as well as a cold, a healthy, uh, program in terms of providing some level of protection to workers who are responding to uh, to uh, to cleanups and and depending on the, the weather situation um, what's the next slide but so he stresses a variety of uh, conditions one of the things that we've talked about uh, there's a, uh, quite a few uh, things that we do to protect people from some of the hazards in terms not only in insects but chemicals, is that we're going to pro provide them with the chemical protective clothing as well as, uh, uh, you know, uh, possibly respirators. And this increases the problem of heat stress because in hot weather, um, chemical protective clothing tends to be impermeable and interferes with our uh, ability to sweat 
and uh, remove the amount of heat we're producing uh, as we work. So uh, really, uh, it's important to have a, some level of heat monitoring for folks who are in this kind of uh, ensemble. And, you know, if we're asking people to handle chemical materials, they, they will probably need some chemical protective apparatus wearing, uh, and they'll also need to be monitored for potential of uh, heat stress and heat stress related uh, issues. It's probably a number of, uh, there's a variety of things to do in terms of heat stress, but well, probably the, one of the, 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 the really benefits we have is uh, the resource, and next slide, Fred, this was the uh, OSHA, the OSHA NIOSH heat safety tool. And this gives you real time heat index information, hourly forecasts, specific to the actual location and during the duration of the response. So what it provides is it gives you an index of saying, you know, this is a really serious problem now because of the, the actual heat index and you need to follow the following precautions and procedures. Um, and, it, and it goes through this in, 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 through the whole period. So what may have been a, a, a common uh, heat, heat uh, index at 11 o'clock may not be the same common heat index at 12, 15 or 2.30. Um, so uh, the OSHA NIOSH heat safety tool is a vital tool in terms of providing not only a, a, you know, a warning system, but also giving some directions in terms of the kinds of things that people need to do to control the potential, uh, potential consequences of heat stress. Next slide, Fred. So cold-related illnesses, probably the most significant is, of course, hypothermia. Um, and and the, the area where cold is, 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 is significant, more significant than normal is if people are working around bodies of water, either uh, it could be you know, near the ocean or lakes or rivers. So if there has been a, a, you know, a flood situation in wintertime, the, 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 this elevates the risk factor of cold-related illness and cold-related uh, injuries related to, uh, related to these kinds of situations. Next slide. Okay, well, so, okay. You, um, so one of the things I wanted to add about the uh, the the app, the tool that that Jim was talking about, of course, when we talk about a widespread disaster, uh, one of the problems is that you may not ha immediately have access to the internet. The heat tool obviously isn't going to give you the 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 actual weather conditions that they, when the, the tool actually goes to the National Weather Service and gets the information to the National Weather Service contemporary with what they're predicting for your area, obviously you wouldn't be able to do that if the, if the internet was down, but the other parts of the tool are installed in, your in whatever device you're using so that you can, uh, if you can come up with say, a weather station, a portable weather station or something of that nature, you can come up with the conditions then you can look at um, what the tool talks about for those conditions, and and so it does have some some uh, uh, some ability to to account for the fact that you the communication is not always straightforward when we talk about this. Um, mold is uh, something that is pervasive whenever we're talking about something like whenever we're talking about getting surfaces wet, particularly when we're talking drywall and and gypsum and even um, wood, uh, mold will, will develop in time. And mold has a number of things. While there's really no such thing as killer mold per se, mold spores, uh, can, when they become active, people can become, uh, can uh, be sensitized to them and can have um, symptoms, uh, can display quite a few symptoms from, as it says down here, infections. Uh, nasal eye and skin irritation. There are a couple of molds um, that are that, that can make people sick. Um, so something that that needs to be it needs to be looked at is um, how you properly uh, take care of the mold. Uh, a couple of the states in the south, they know that mold is enough of a problem that they actually have a, a system for licensing uh, mold removers. I. Uh, so th that uh, they, they are, their people have to be trained and they have to know to, 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 um, 
to dress similar to what we have here. And as Jim pointed out, of course, that does increase that the, the issue of, of uh, heat stress, but um, it's sort of, you have to be concerned of covering one hazard with the other, and then be sure that you give plenty of rest breaks for those people. But anyway, this is, mold is a problem. Uh, this gives a little more, this is another one of those, those take, um, pages out of the book I was talking about, and it talks about what it takes for, for mold um, and the measures for things like training decontamination, um, and it gives what PPE you should wear and, and so forth. So you're, you want to be sure that you've covered the surfaces that could that could be that the, the mold spores could affect. Whenever we're talking about um, a, any sort of major um, disaster, uh, uh, we're talking we're often talking about using various kinds of equipment heavy equipment and other kinds of equipment. And whenever we're talking about working around heavy equipment or around equipment, um, we have the, the problem that um, you, people can get hurt from the equipment itself. Uh, chainsaws uh, and chippers, chainsaws. One of the things that we've seen even in, in um, there was a, a, a small um, um, tornado that hit Revere. 2014, something like that. And one of the things that we noticed, I worked for OSHA at the time, and one of the things that we noticed was that we had an awful lot of people that suddenly thought they could make a little extra money by pulling out their chainsaw. Unfortunately, they hadn't been trained in how to work, how to do things like keep the, their, their, if you're using it all the time, you got to keep the chainsaw sharp. You got to make sure that, that you know, you check the, the tautness of the chain. You got to make sure that 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 your your uh, chainsaw that if you're going to use a chainsaw that that you have proper uh, that proper way to get to whatever height you need to get to if you're going to cut down a tree things of that nature and then we have you have chippers um, and these the large industrial chippers uh, have a lot of potential for someone getting caught uh, usually you know you start seeing people throwing throwing uh, limbs in a chipper. It's easy to get caught in those limbs if you've got a if you're pulling them at too rapid a pace, and then of course you've got things like noise if you're using them all the time, uh, and the the if if you're in any sort of enclosed area, these things often run on gasoline, so you have the concerns about carbon monoxide and other uh, products of combustion that may be may come out of them. But chippers are are something that. Um, many of they don't really have a good way to guard them, and um, in most cases, so feeding them, having a method for for how the wood gets into the feeder is uh, is important, and people need to be trained on on how to do that. Uh, and this is talking a little more about the, the what you need when you're working with a, a chainsaw, um, you know the. All of these kinds of things, you want to be sure that you've got cut resistant leg wear. We've had to see a number of, of people. We saw several people that got um, that used their chainsaw and got badly cut uh, during the uh, Springfield, uh, after the Springfield uh, um, or Western Mass tornado. Um, and, and whenever you're, you've are you got people around you, you're working in an, in an area, you need to be sure that people are away from you. I already talked about the problems of cutting down a tree. Uh, whenever you're you're doing anything like like uh, felling trees, that's something that, that is best done by people that have some training on how to do it. Uh, you, there's a, a concept called the drop zone um, that that is important. Um, I I was when I responded in uh, to Katrina, one of the things that we ran into a couple of times. Actually, one time I had somebody that was in a tree. Cutting down limbs, and his, and he had his his uh, son, his small son, maybe nine or ten years old, and his wife walking under the tree while he was cutting, and they were pulling the limbs out. Well, of course, if one of those limbs came down on one of those, those on either one of those people, it would have been disastrous. So, um, again, figuring out how, what you know things like clear zones and drop zones and all that becomes important when you're when you're cutting. You're doing that kind of thing, as well as making sure that when you're getting elevated, um, you don't use a, a, a ladder of some kind that's going to 
put you in, in the way of the drop zone. So um, this is talking about when we're talking about moving things, you've got debris, um, it, especially if you're talking uh, that there can be loose debris and things of that nature. Uh, if you've got water or you got air movement, wind movement, things of that nature, the loose debris can be kicked up. Um, and then there, it, and if something gets, if you get cut, then tetanus can be a problem. So you need to be sure if you step on debris and the debris has a nail in it, or the debris has some of the other things that you might have when you're, when you're responding, uh, the proper person protective equipment. Uh, I, I know that anytime you're working around debris like this, the safety shoe should include a, a steel shank if possible because um, the, the, that way you're protecting against things like nails and pins and, and uh, uh, rebar and things of that nature that can be sticking out of the ground. Um, you've got, but you need, and then of course work gloves so you don't get wind up with it in your, in your, in your hands. Um, whenever we're talking about working around heavy equipment like this, you wanna be sure that there, it, that whoever is doing it, whomever is doing it has been trained in how to work around this equipment. And of course the heavy equipment operator should know how to use their equipment. One of the things that, that anyone that's working around this equipment needs to realize is that it's with much of the heavy equipment where the employee, where the, the operator is elevated, they can't see immediately behind that, that whatever that piece of equipment is. You need to be back a fair distance or as the, if they have to back up, they could easily not see somebody and run over them. Um, in fact, one of the things that uh, I listened to a talk once from some operating engineers that had responded to one of the major hurricanes and, and they, they said that um, they had four um, projects that they were working on that the, the whoever had had planned the projects had planned them so poorly that the equipment was actually running into each other. There were four separate jobs, but they were so close together that the operators couldn't see. You know, they need at least fifteen feet and sometimes thirty feet, depending on the equipment, to be able to see the ground. And they were they weren't able to see smaller pieces of equipment that might be around them when, with some of the larger pieces. So you need to be sure that that um, people know what they're doing, that, that any swing radiuses that might exist, if you have, if this, if this is, has the capability of turning, so you have a bucket uh, that, that has the ability to turn, uh, you want, don't want the person to get hit by the bucket, you don't want them to get hit by the turret, um, various things of that nature. You want to be sure that if you're using a, a crane or some sort of lifting equipment that you have a, a that you have an area uh, listed for, um, uh, an area that, that's cleared so that uh, you don't get hit. Um, anybody, anytime someone, you have a vehicle needs to back up, uh, there should be a spotter behind them to tell, let them know. That there are backup alarms as well that much of the equipment has, but um, backup equipment is, uh, backup alarms can sometimes become so common that they get, um, that they, uh, People don't re realize they're there. They get lost in the in the noise of the of the job. So having having something to let people know about th that that equipment is is moving is important. Um, portable tools, other types of hand tools, and they have the, the same hazards they always have. Uh, the of course some of the differences are that if you're trying to work with something on an uneven surface. Or there's a potential, you know, on a, on a, you're trying to cut something that's on a debris pile, and and you're trying to get access. Uh, that you need to be sure that you don't have it in such a way that you're gonna you're gonna fall in, or you're gonna have some other kind of problem. Um, and then accounting for the hazards of whatever it is that's powering your equipment. So if you're gonna, if it's an electric, if it's a portable power tool, it's probably using electricity. Anytime you're working on a surface there that you should have a ground fault circuit interrupter that protects that circuit uh, for, for the worker um, or the workers should have a double insulated tools, one or the other. Um, the, uh, or the preferred method, if you can possibly do it, which is to use battery operated tools, which cuts down on, on, the, on the potential for, um, for electric shock. 
um, and um, this, and then we're, so the hazards here um, can if you've got various kinds of tools can can uh, not be in good shape, um, things of that nature. So we need to be aware of of um, the equipment that's being used. Um, lifting, one of the things you do a lot of is lifting. Uh, now you got to think about am I lifting at at an angle that I I, sh I can't I shouldn't be lifting at? Or am I um, you know how much weight? And whenever we're talking about lifting something, we need to be concerned about uh, the the that it's that all weights are not the same. That you need to be if you're looking at a piece of equipment that or looking at lifting something that is awkward. That's that becomes a problem. So uh, lifting, training people to do lifting and training people to, to know when they need to have more than one person helping them lift and training them as to when they need to get get something in the way of of uh, mechanical equipment to help them with the lift is important. Um, vibration is a concern if you're using any sort of tools that vibrate. So if you're your uh, jackhammer or something of that nature, uh, vibration can can be a problem. You need to get proper protection for that. Uh, that usually there are gloves it, it, that you can get for uh, vibration uh, to protect against vibration. The thing is, however, if you're getting those gloves, you want to be sure that you get gloves that protect against the frequencies, the vibration frequencies that the tool is emitting. Because we've had too many. We had a, used to have a real problem with people getting vibratory uh, gloves, but they didn't protect against the the um, frequencies that the tool itself emitted. Um, you, you know, be sure that the tools you're using have the proper grips um, and things of that nature. Uh, if you if you're you have something that and this this can happen sometimes you have something that looks fine, it's something you've lifted before, but and I'm trying to think of an example uh, because I saw I've seen several where you, they had a handle originally. And either it, the handle has been torn off or broken or something of that nature. And now you think, well, I, I lifted this before. You lifted it because it had, a, it had assistance to help you lift. If you now have something that doesn't have that, take that into account when, whenever you're considering uh, lifting something. Um, slips, trips, and falls, probably one of the biggest sources of, of injury uh, in in a lot of places is slips, trips, and falls. If you're working in the winter and it's icy, certainly uh, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, if you're working, uh, you know, you've got something in, the, in your walkway, you're, you're carrying something and there's a tree limb or there's things of that nature, you can trip on them. Um, people working, you know, you, you need to get up on a, to get something and you don't have the proper tool or ladder. So the temptation is to, to try to, uh, do something makeshift, and then you fall off of that. That that's a uh, a common problem in in uh, this kind of of situation. Um, and this is just talking some more about that. You want to be sure that. Um, that I mean, this is talking about cuts and punctures. I'm sorry, and, and that's punctures are probably one of the toughest things to. To protect against, but when you're looking at anything that where you get cut, you want to be sure that you have cut proof or you have something that's cut resistant or puncture resistant in the way of gloves, if possible, in the way of of um, other protective clothing, um, and then try to avoid using gloves to pick up things that might puncture you if it's at all possible. So things as they talk about forceps or or other kinds of tools for for picking things up. Um, if you're talking about a, a pile of debris that has things in it that are that are um, potential to be puncture or, or cut problems, then maybe use something like a shovel to move the material, to uh, move it in bulk into a container and then handle the container rather than handling the individual pieces. But uh, whatever or you need to account for the possibility that, that punctures are can be a real problem. I'll be sure that and be sure for any of these kinds of things that you've got a first aid kit around. Uh, if you're talking about a puncture, of course, one of the concerns can be tetanus. 
um, and that should never be underestimated. Um, if, if the person has not had a tetanus shot, anyone that's responding should have an idea when their last tetanus shot was um, because tetanus is a, can be a real problem in, in, uh, with punctures that you would get in this kind of a thing. Um, and then one of the things that can be a, a problem is um, what we was traumatic stress. One of the things that a lot of people, if you've never responded before, you don't know what it is that would cause you to, to be affected mentally by, by what you're seeing. Um, when I responded to Katrina, I was surprised because for me, it wasn't a big deal. And I'm not, I, I'm just saying I, I knew in advance this could be an issue because I had uh, set up programs for, for this kind of thing for, our, for the people with, in OSHA. And uh, I, so I um, was surprised when I got back and found that about a third of the people, or a quarter of the people, more like a quarter of the people that OSHA sent to, um, to the Katrina and, and, and the Katrina response in one way or another needed to take advantage of speaking to someone about the traumatic stress uh, when, they re when they got back. But you need to be sure that there is some place that people can, can go. And then it's important that you, you have a work rest cycle, you, do, you work a normal, as much as possible, you try to be somewhat normal in your eating and your sleeping it's real important that you, you sleep when you're working in something like this and that you drink, as it says there, take in plenty of fluids. Okay, since we had the problems with the pretest, Jim, can we skip the post test? Everybody got the pretest right, so. Yeah. You're muted. Okay. There we go. Uh, I think, yeah, no problem. Let's go. Uh, I think the last slide is the uh, resources. Yep. Yep. So I think it's important. Um, one of the things is, you know, we've only touched the surface on a lot of these issues. And, and we, we uh, you know, th this presentation was part of a developed a three hour presentation from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences worker training program. Um, one of the, the, the takeaways is that, you know, as we're preparing more and more for the potential for uh, major, major events, major disasters, um, is to really look at how do we pre, uh, pre plan for these things. And, you know, there are a good deal, there's a good deal of information and resources out there. Uh, CDC NIOSH has provided multiple guidelines and resources since the beginning of the, the series of events in the, in the 90s. Um, it also has developed a disaster site worker training project. It's a two-day training, uh, which, you know, we always recommend that uh, folks who uh, are going to be facing disasters look at, look at this as a potential way of tra training their staff or the people that are going to be involved with uh, responding to situations within their own facility or if they're a, a more a public response, that this is a, a, a real resource and a vital resource. And in addition, it's a similar uh, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences has a training program, which we're part of. Uh, you know, RICOSH is part of that network through the TNIC uh, the consortium. But the, um, the, uh, the, the, they just produced a, 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 an app, which is similar to the OSHA app. Uh, and it is what is what it does is download you can app on Android services, and it's a user guide that walks through uh, uh, um, uh, a variety of situations that can occur in a post disaster situation. So it's kind of like the OSHA app, and you know, it gives you a, a, a immediate communication. You know, if there's a situation like Fred mentioned, where there's a a potential for a problem working around, you know, uh, heavy equipment, uh, and there's some issues that come up. Uh, you know, you can go on the app and see what the recommendations that the NAHS is making. So, um, uh, it's it's really important that we kind of start thinking ahead in terms of providing uh, absolutely more robust training to different uh, different communities that are going to need some of this training as we look for more potential problems um, down the road.
Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments.